This is part three of a reading of a vile sermon from 1832 titled The Religious Instruction of the Negroes by Rev. Charles Colcock Jones. Note that I'm reading it for its historical value only. I personally find it one of the most disgusting written works I have yet encountered. Summary of the text so far. In the 1830s, the slave masters of Georgia decided they should preach the gospel to their Negroes because of how lazy and depraved these slaves were. Accepting the gospel would help the Negroes be better slaves, and their slave masters would get a big reward in heaven. But ordinary church wouldn't work. The slaves didn't attend often enough, and when they did, the sermons were not dumbed down enough for a Negro to understand. So, a plan was devised to set up religious education stations on the boundaries between the plantations, and to send specially trained teachers onto the plantations to teach the Negroes religion at a level they could comprehend. And since the teachers would be southern gentlemen picked by the slave masters, there was no risk of spreading ideas about freedom amongst the slaves. Furthermore, the plan was so devised to keep the Negroes illiterate and never teach them anything other than the gospel according to those who were enslaving them. And now part three. Objection number three. This plan interferes with the planter's arrangements and will probably expose him to the slanders of the teachers. The plan cannot interfere with the planter's arrangements. If he pleases to permit teachers to come to his place, they will come at whatever time he shall appoint and continue their meetings no longer than may be agreeable to him. The planter is to please himself. He is not to conform to the arrangements of the society, but the society is to conform to his. For the society knows very well that it has no more right to interfere in his plantation's arrangements than they have to interfere in those of his family. That the planter will suffer from the slanderous reports of the teachers, we hope may never be a fact. When the teacher comes on a plantation, he comes, as it were, into a private family. It would be almost unpardonable in a man to come with professions of friendship to do us the kindness and service of religiously instructing our servants and then discovering something which he may deem improper in our treatment of our servants or in their conduct toward us to go away and make it a matter of public notoriety. He betrays the confidence reposed in him. He is unfaithful to his trust. We hope the society may never hold in its bosom such a man. We hope it may never shake the hand of fellowship with him. In order to avoid everything of this nature, it shall be the duty of the executive committee to appoint as teacher men of judgment and discretion, and to inculcate in their private conference with them the Christian duty of abstaining from any comment whatever upon what they see or hear while engaged in the discharge of their important duties. Objection 4. This plan will take up too much of the teacher's time and subject him to great inconvenience. What great and good work is there that requires no sacrifice of time and convenience? And is the sacrifice of time and convenience in the present work so great as to deter us from it? Let us see if it is. As to time, the teacher will devote perhaps, at most, but one evening to the instruction of the Negroes, and surely he can so arrange his business as not to suffer other engagements to interfere with this. And now, what is it for us to devote one evening in the week to our servants when their whole time is devoted to us, especially, too, when we seek to promote the salvation of their immortal souls? It is a shame for any man to talk of the sacrifice of time. As to inconvenience, the teacher will not ride at the extent more than a few miles. He may sometimes have his zeal and resolution tested by a dark or rainy evening. But what is the inconvenience of a short ride and sometimes a stormy night for the benefit of those who are employed in labor for us through all the changes of weather during the year and who have no other time in the week to attend religious meetings? It is a shame for any man to talk of the sacrifice of convenience. 
The trouble of preparation for his meetings should be something to the teacher. He is engaged in most important and momentous labors. They reach into eternity, and he should discharge them to the best of his abilities. He should bring forth out of his treasures things new and old, so as always to interest and instruct his charge. But considering how many excellent helps we now have in interpreting and illustrating Scripture, he may make his trouble comparatively light. And what is the trouble of preparation to a man who fills the value of the soul, to a man engaged in the work of converting men unto God? The trouble is not then thought of. Do then teachers who are interested in their work complain of the trouble of preparation? No. They know by experience that the scripture is true which saith, He that watereth shall himself be watered. They are watered in having their skirts clear of the blood of souls, in obtaining a more intimate acquaintance with the word of God, and in enjoying the happiness consequent upon sincere labors in the cause of Christ. We feel that if we can see our servants attentive to our instructions, improving in morality, above all, heartily embracing religion, we shall feel amply compensated for any sacrifice of time and convenience to which we shall be subjected. And by the blessing of God, may we not hope for this. Objection 5 this plan of instructing the Negroes will do no good. It will only make them worse hypocrites and worse men. It has been tried before. We confess that we are unable to feel the force of this objection. Our object will be to teach as God shall enable us the gospel to the Negroes. Will any man say that the tendency of the gospel is to make men worse than they are? If any man says this, we earnestly hope that he will put himself to the trouble of examining the gospel itself and its legitimate effects upon mankind. We think that he will be convinced of his error. Wherever the gospel is statedly and faithfully preached, the result is favorable to the piety and morality of the people. We can see no reason whatever why it should produce an effect on our Negroes contrary to that which it is designed by infinite wisdom and benevolence to produce, and which it actually produces on all other men and on some whose condition is worse than that of our Negroes. And from what people did we, with all our piety and morality and knowledge, spring from a people once as degraded as Negroes. And what has lifted us so far above our progenitors? The gospel, and nothing else. Is there not then a redeeming power in the gospel for the Africans? We firmly believe that there is. Without this belief, we would not make an effort to give it to them. The unintelligible or corrupt preaching of the gospel may make men worse, but never the preaching of the pure gospel. We are quite certain that no plan of instruction like the present has ever been in operation in this country. The efforts heretofore made have been quite partial and for the most part irregular, and it would not be proper for us, considering God's general course in providence and in grace, to expect much decided good from such efforts. And even admitting that the Negroes have hardened themselves and grown worse under former advantages, this should not discourage us from attempting something more in their behalf. It should operate as an additional and very powerful reason why we should attempt something more in their behalf. But may we not go further? Admitting we were assured beforehand that our labors would be contemned, and result only in great indifference to religion and an increased hardness of heart, even this assurance ought not to deter us from duty. God, sometimes in the accomplishment of his purposes and of his great mercy, commands advantages to be multiplied to those who will certainly abuse them. The Jews in the days of Christ were a remarkable instance of this. Matthew 23 verses 33 and 39. But it may be questioned if this objection is supported by a solitary fact. 
On the contrary, we believe that in the judgment of sober, unprejudiced men, whenever the Negroes have enjoyed for any reasonable time the privileges of the gospel, they will, in point of order and morality, be found in advance of those who have not enjoyed them. These are some of the objections which have been urged against our plan of conveying religious instruction to our servants. And after duly considering them, we do not think that they are of sufficient weight to deter us from our purpose. It is a matter of astonishment that there should be any objection at all, for the duty of giving religious instruction to our Negroes and the benefits flowing from it should be obvious to all. The benefits we conceive to be incalculably great, and some of them are the following. 1. There will be a better understanding of the mutual relations of master and servant. We doubt not that there are many of our fellow citizens, and we would implicate ourselves in the charge, who have never given themselves the trouble to inquire into the number and nature of those duties which they owe to their servants, and are in reason and in conscience bound to perform. Nor do we think that our servants generally understand their duties towards us, and from what motives they should be performed. In many instances they learn them after failure to perform them, through punishment which might have been saved by a little timely instruction. And although the relative duties of master and servant are so important and are so often insisted upon and defined in the scriptures, we do not recollect ever to have heard a sermon from the pulpit concerning them. 2. That there will be greater subordination and a decrease of crime amongst the Negroes. It is well known that slavery existed in the Roman Empire during the life of Christ and his apostles and that many slaves became converts during their preaching. It appears that they did not interfere at all with the civil condition of the slaves nor pass any opinion concerning it, but preach to them the plain gospel, which is limited to every class and condition of men, and inculcated the duty of obedience in a very high degree. The following passages will suffice as a specimen. Servants, be obedient to your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service as men-pleasers, but as servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. Servants, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, and whatsoever ye do, do it heartily as to the Lord, not unto men. Let as many servants as are under the yoke count their masters worthy of all honor, etc. And the Apostle Paul commands ministers to exhort servants to be obedient unto their own masters and to please them well in all things, etc. Ephesians 6, 5 and 6, Colossians 3, 22, 1 Timothy 6, 1, Titus 2, 9. And other passages of the like import, which any one may see for himself by consulting the New Testament, particularly the epistle to Philemon, where it appears that the Apostle Paul sends back Onesimus, a runaway slave, to his master. It will be noticed that obedience is inculcated as a Christian duty, binding on the servants, and thus the authority of masters is supported by considerations drawn from eternity. Now, it would be a prime object with the teachers to tread in the footsteps of the apostles. Will the authority of the masters be weakened by instructions of this sort? No, it will be strengthened and we believe that their authority can be strengthened and supported in this way only. For the duty of obedience will never be felt and performed to the extent that we desire it, unless we can bottom it on religious principle. End of part three.